From Seattle, Washington, it's theCUBE, covering KubeCon and CloudNativeCon North America 2018. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Cloud Native Computing Foundation, and its ecosystem partners. Okay, welcome back everyone. We are here live with CUBE coverage, three days of wall-to-wall -wall coverage here at KubeCon, CloudNativeCon 2018 in Seattle. I'm John Furrier with the CUBE, Stu Miniman here, breaking it down. We're at day two, we got a lot of action. David Ronchik, who's the head of open source ML strategy at Azure, at Microsoft, Microsoft Azure, formerly of Google, now at Microsoft. Welcome back to the CUBE. We had a great chat at Copenhagen, good to see you. Great to see you too, thank you so much for having me. You've been there from day one, it's still kind of day one in, in Kubernetes, still growing. You got a new gig, you're at Microsoft, formerly at Google. You had a great talk at Google Next, by the way, which we watched and, and caught on online. You just, you're still doing the same thing. Take a minute to explain kind of what the new job is, what your focus is. Absolutely. So in many ways, I'm doing uh, a very similar job to the one I was doing at Google, except now across all of uh, Azure. Um, you know, when you look at machine learning today, uh, the truth of the matter is, is uh, it is about open source. It's about pulling in the best from academia and open source contributors, developers, across the spectrum. And while I was at Google, I was able to launch the Kubeflow project, which solves a very specific but very important problem. Uh, now that you look at Azure, a company that is growing, uh, excuse me, a division that is growing extremely quickly and looking to expand their overall open source offerings, uh, make investments, uh, work with partners and projects, and make sure that, that researchers and customers are able to get to machine learning solutions very quickly, uh, I'm coming in to help them think about how to make those investments and accelerate customers' overall time to solutions. So both on the commercial side, Azure, which has got a business objective to make mm -hmm. money, but also open source. So about the, is it still open source for you? Is it all open source or is it crossing a little bit of both? Just quickly clarify that. Yeah, yeah there's no question. Um, uh, you know, obviously Azure's a business, they pay me a salary, and, and we're going to have a great uh, first party solution for all of these various things. But the reality is, much like Kubernetes has both a commercial offering and an open source offering, I think that all the major cloud pro providers will have that kind of duality. They'll work in open source and, and you can measure you know, how many contributions and what they're doing in the open source projects, but then they'll also have hosted and other versions that make it easier for customers to migrate their data and adopt some of these new solutions. You know, one of the things that's interesting on that point, because this is a super important point, is that open source community that's here with Kubernetes, around Kubernetes, you know, it's all kind of upstream kind of concept, but the downstream impacts are IT and your classic developers. You have your open source yeah. kind of thing going on, and that's the core of this community and event. The IT investments are shifting. In 2019, mm -hmm. we are seeing the trend of uh, somewhat radical, but certainly a reimagining of the IT. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly, you guys have gone cloud at Azure, have seen that, that result. Absolutely. Good pickup by customers, Office 365. That's now a SaaS, it's now, now you've got cloud, you've got cloud scale. This is where machine learning is really shining. So I, the question to you is, what do you think is going to be the big impact in 2019 to IT investment strategies in terms of what they, how they procure and consume technology, how they build their apps with the new goodness coming in from Kubernetes, et cetera. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, I remember back in the day, um, uh, you know, I was an IT admin myself, and, and I carried a pager for literally when, you know, a machine went down, or a power supply went out, or this RAM was bad, or something like that. Um, today, if you went to even the most sophisticated IT shop, they would be like, what are you, crazy? You, you should never carry a pager for that. You should have a system that understands it's okay if something that low level goes out. That's exactly what Kubernetes provided. It provided this abstraction layer on top of this. So if it went down, uh, Kubernetes knew how to reschedule a pod and move things back and forth. Taking that one step further, now into machine learning, uh, unfortunately today, People are carrying pagers for the equivalent of if a power supply goes out or something goes wrong. It's still way too low level. We're asking data scientists, ML engineers to think about how to provision pods, how to work on drivers, how to do all these very, very low level things. With things like Kubernetes, with things like Kubeflow, you're now able to give higher level abstraction so a data scientist can come in and you know, open up their Jupyter Notebook, work on a model, see how it works, and when they're done, they hit a button and it will provision out all the machines necessary, all the drivers, all the everything, spin it up, run that training job, and bring it back, and shut everything down. So, so Dave, I wonder if you can help expand on that a little bit yeah. more. So, you know, one of the things that, that's great about Kubernetes is it can live in a diverse amount of infrastructures. Mm. 
one of the biggest challenges with machine learning is, you know, where's my data? How do I get to the right place? Where do I do the training? Uh, you know, we've been spending a lot, a couple of years looking at, you know, edge and, you know, what's the connectivity and how we're going to do this. Can you help just kind of pan us picture of the landscape and what do we have solved and what are we working at trying to you know, put together? Yeah, you know, I think that's a really excellent question. Um, uh, today, there's so much focus on, well, are you going to choose PyTorch or TensorFlow, CNTK, MXNet, you know, NumPy, Scikit-Learn. There are a bunch of really great frameworks out there done in the open source and we're really excited. But the reality is when you look at the overall landscape, that's just 5% of the work that the average data scientist goes through. Exactly to your point, how do I get my data in? How do I transform it? How do I visualize it? Generate statistics on it. Uh, make sure that it's not biased towards certain populations. Uh, and then once I'm done training, how do I roll it out to production and monitor it and log and all these things? And that's really what we're talking about. That's what we tried to work on when it comes to Kubeflow, is, is to think about this in a much broader sense. And so you take things like data. Um, uh, the reality is, is you can't beat the speed of light. Uh, if I have a petabyte of data here, uh, it's going to take a long time to move it over there. And so you're going to be really thoughtful about those kind of things. I, I'm very hopeful that academic research and, and uh, industry will figure out ways to reduce the amount of data and make it much, much more sane uh, in, in uh, overall addressing this problem and make it easier to train in various locations. But the reality is, is I think you're ultimately going to have models and training and inference move to many, many different locations. And so you'll do inference at the edge on my phone or on a you know, little Bluetooth device in the corner of my house saying whether or not it's too hot or too cold. We're going to need that kind of intelligence and we're going to do that kind of training and data collection at the edge. Do you see a, the landscape evolving where you have specialty ML? For instance, like the big conversation in IoT mm. is move you know, compute to the data, yeah. right? Re reach that latency. Do you see machine learning models moving around at code, so I can throw machine learning at a problem, and, is that, and that, is that where Kubernetes fits in? I'm trying to put together a mental model of how to think about how ML scales. Yeah. Can you, what's your vision on that? How do you see that evolving? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that, you know, going back to what we talked about at the beginning, um, we're really moving to much more of a solution-driven architecture today. Um, ML uh, you know, is great and the academic research is phenomenal, but it is academic research. It didn't really start to take off until people invented things, or you know, created things like uh, ImageNet and MobileNet and things like that that did very important things like object detection, but then the people, the, you know, uh, commercial researchers were able to take that and move that into locations where people actually needed it. I think you will continue to see that, that migration. I don't think you're going to have single ML models that do a hundred different things. You're going to have a single ML model that does a vertical specific thing, anomaly detection in whatever, factories, uh, and you're going to use that in a whole variety of locations rather than trying to you know, develop one ML model to solve them all. So it's application specific or vertical. Absolutely. All right, so that means the data is super important. Absolutely. Quality data, clean data, is clean results. Dirty data, bad results. Absolutely right. People have been in this kind of virtuous circle of cleaning data. You know, you guys know at Google, certainly, Microsoft as well, you know, data, data quality is critical. But you got the horizontally scalable mm. cloud, but you need specialism around the data and for the ML. How, how do you see that, is that, I mean, obviously it sounds like the right architecture, yeah, but yeah. this is where the, 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 the finesse is and the nuance. How so, do you see that? So, you know, you, you bring up a really interesting point. Um, uh, today, the, the biggest problem is, is how much data there is, right? It's not a matter of um, uh, whether or not you're able to process it, you are, um, but, but it's so easy to get lost, to get caught in little anomalies. You know, if you have a petabyte of data and whatever, a megabyte of it is the thing that's causing your model to go sideways, that's really hard to detect. Um, I think what you're seeing right now is a lot of academic research, um, which I'm very optimistic about, that will ultimately reduce that, that will both call out, hey, this particular data is, smells kind of weird, maybe take a closer look at this, um, or you will see a, a, a smaller need for training, you know, where it was once a petabyte, you're able to train on just 10 gigabytes. Uh, I'm very optimistic that both of those things happen, and as you start to get to that, you get better signal to noise, and you start saying, oh, in fact, this is questionable data, let's move that off to the side or, or spend more time on it, rather than what happens today, which is, oh, I got this model, 
and it works pretty well. I'm just going to throw everything at it and try and you know, get yeah. some answer out and then we'll go from there. And that's where a lot of false positives come in, all Absolutely. that good stuff. All right, so, so take it to the next level. Here at uh, KubeCon, Cloud Native Con, in this community where Kubernetes is the center of all these sets of services and building blocks, where's the ML action? What, if I'm, I'm showing, I want to jump into this community, I'm watching this, but hey, you know what? I got Amazon Web Services, reInvent, just pumping up a lot of ML yep. and AI, you know, SageMaker and a bunch of other things. What's going on in this community? Where are the projects? What are the notable things? Where can I jump in? and engage, what's the, what's, the, what's the map look like? How do I navigate? Yeah, absolutely, so uh, obviously I'm pretty biased. Uh, you know, I helped start Kubeflow, we're very, very excited about that. Um, so Kubeflow's but, one. Yeah, absolutely, but, but let me speak a little bit more broadly. Uh, Kubernetes gives you this wonderful platform, highly scalable, incredibly portable, and, and I can't overstate how valuable that portability is. The reality is, is that customers have, we talked about data a bunch already. They have data on-prem, they have data in cloud A, cloud B, it's everywhere, they want to bring it together, they want to bring the, the training and the inference to where the data is. Kubernetes solves that for you. It gives you portability, it lets you abstract away the underlying stuff, it gives you great scalability and reliability, and it lets you compose these highly complex pipelines together that let you do real training anywhere. Rather than having to take all your data and move it to a cloud and train on a single VM that you're not sure whether or not it's been updated or not, this is the way to go. Versus the old way, which was what? Because that's an easier way, orchestrating and managing that. What was the alternative? The alternative was you built it yourself. You, you pieced together a whole bunch of solutions, you wired it together, you made sure that this service over here had the right a user account to access the data that that service over there was outputting. It was just <laughs> yeah. crazy town. Yeah. Now, you use Kubernetes constructs, you use first class objects, you extend the native Kubernetes API, and it works on your laptop, and it works on cloud A, and B, and on-prem, and wherever you need it to run the your training rig. that's the magic, basically. Absolutely. All right, so multi-cloud has come up a lot. Hybrid cloud's the buzzword of the year. I call yeah. that the 2018, maybe 19 buzzword. But I think the real end game in all this is what, from a customer standpoint that we're reporting on SiliconANGLE and theCUBE is, Choice. Yep. Multi-vendor is the new multi-cloud. Is the multi-cloud's the modern version of the old multi-vendor concept. Yes. Which basically is choice. Absolutely. So how does Kubernetes fit into the multi-cloud? Why is that good for uh, the industry? Um, what's your take on that? Can you share your perspective? Absolutely. So when you go and look at the recent right scale reports, 81% of enterprises today are multi-cloud. Full stop. 81%. And not just one cloud. Uh, they're, they're on five different clouds. That could be on-prem, could be multi-zone, could be Google or Amazon or Azure. Salesforce, you name it. how you define cloud. They're spreading, <laughs> they're doing it because that kind of portability is right for their business. Kubernetes gives you the opportunity to operate in an abstraction layer that works across all of these clouds. So whether or not you're on your laptop and you're using Docker or Minikube, you're, you're on your private training rig, whether or not you go to Google Cloud or Azure, on Google Cloud, GKE, Azure, you have AKS, these you're able to build CI CD systems, continuous delivery systems, that, that use common Kubernetes constructs. I want to roll this application out, I want there to be seven pods, I want it to have an endpoint that looks like this, and that works anywhere you have a Kubernetes conformant cluster. And when it gets to really complex apps, like machine learning, you're able to do that at a high, even a higher level using uh, constructs like Kubeflow and all the many, many packages that go into Kubeflow. We have NVIDIA contributing and Uber, yeah. we have uh, you know, Intel and I mean just countless, Cisco, I, you know, I, I hesitate to keep naming names because I'll be here all day, but yeah. you know, we have literally I over mean, 100 Cisco contributors. Cisco is a great tailwind for Cisco. They're going to have network, every, everybody wins. The, the CICD sides for developers, one common construct, the network guys get more appropriate, because if you decompose an application, Absolutely. the network ties it together. Yeah. So everybody wins in the stack. Absolutely. And I think hybrid is really interesting. You know, hybrid kind of gets a dirty word. People are like, oh my God, you know, why would you ever deploy to multiple clouds? Uh, why would you ever spread across multiple clouds? And that I agree with. A true hybrid deployment today isn't, well, I'm going to take my app and I'm going to spread it across six different locations. In fact, what you really want to do is have isolated deployments to each place that you, enables you, in a single button, deploy to all three of these locations. But, to isolate them. To have this particular application go, and if you know, AWS has an outage, GCP is there. Or if GCP has an outage, Azure is there. And you can do that uh, very readily. 
or you can bring it closed for geographic reasons or legal reasons or whatever it might be. Um, those kind of flexibility, that ability to take a single construct of your application yeah. and deploy it to each one of these locations, not spreading yeah. them, but in fact, just giving you those, that flexibility gives you pricing power, gives you flexibility, and lets you take advantage of if what's you have the operating model. If the if the if the exactly. CI/CD is common, and that's the key value right there. Absolutely right, David. Thanks so much for coming on theCUBE. As usual, great commentary, great insight there. Um, been there from the beginning. Just final question: predictions for 2019 <laughs> in Kubernetes. What's going to happen in 2019? with Kubernetes, what's your prediction? Well, I, I, think, I think you've heard this message over and over again. Um, you're, you're seeing uh, Kubernetes become boring, and, and that is incredibly powerful. The, the stability, the flexibility, people are building enormous businesses on top of it, um, but not just that. They're also continuing to build things like the, the um, custom resource definition, which lets you extend Kubernetes in a safe and secure way. And that's incredibly important. That means you don't have to go and check in code into the main tree in order to make yeah. extensions. You're yeah. able to build on top of it. And you're seeing more and more businesses build great solutions, customer focused solutions. Well next time we get together, I want to do a drill down on the, what the word stack means. I heard people say <laughs> Kubernetes stack. I'm like, right. yeah, <laughs> like they love the stack words. It's not a stack anymore, it sets the services. David, thanks so much for coming on, I appreciate it. Uh, here are the CUBE coverage, live here in Seattle for KubeCon. CloudNativeCon, I'm John Furrier with Stu Miniman. We'll be back with more after this short break. <laughs>